Peter Noonan and Andrew Wade from ASIL Allen, who have been the um, lead directors and managers of this piece of work uh, on completions in the engineering trades. Uh, and they've also been supported by NCBER. I thought just in terms of a bit of background, um, so everyone's aware why we did this study. Um, as probably many of you know, the board's always been quite interested in the issue of completions in the VET sector, and in particular that they are not as high as we would like. And the reason for this is both in terms of supply of skills and potential impact on skill shortage, also potentially because it represents poor investment for both government and individuals and employers as well, actually. And because potentially it reflects poor quality. The other factor that was a bit of an impetus for this study was that there was a Senate inquiry into shortages of engineering and related employment skills back in July 2012. And one of the recommendations was actually that ALPA should investigate the issue of low completions in engineering trades. Now, although we haven't been formally asked by government to follow through on this recommendation, the board decided that it would do this work in any case. So they were the sort of drivers for why this piece of work. And of course, it's actually also very timely um, because it's now going to feed into the work that Orpah's doing on the engineering workforce in general. So hopefully to Barb and her team, it'll be a very important piece of work. So today, we're very pleased to have uh, Peter and Andrew with us. And in terms of the format today, uh, they're going to present the findings to us. And uh, we, we're going to suggest that we just allow them to do that presentation, partly because we are filming today, and also because we have colleagues who are te teleconferencing in. So they'll be looking at the, uh, at the presentation that they've been given, the PowerPoint. And then at the end, there'll be plenty of opportunity for questions and discussions. Uh, I think, as you all know, the, board, the paper's going to be formally tabled at our board meeting in February, and then we'll be disseminating it further. So I'd now like to introduce Peter, who I believe is going to introduce the research work, and uh, we look forward to your discussion. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, colleagues who have worked with in the past from Orpa, Sue and Jennifer and others. Uh, really good to present today, but also um, to have been uh, successful in uh, being asked to do this piece of work, which we saw as being um, particularly important. Um, as people who are involved in the steering committee would know, um, I, I certainly um, have long taken the view that um, in VET we've taken far too um, lacks an attitude to the question of completion rates, both in apprenticeship and generally, and hidden for too long under you know, high module load completion rates and things like that. And as the um, as the project implies, um, unsuccessful completions, uh, lost opportunities, lost productivity, um, and um, my view, and I think it's our view, it's reflected in the report really, is that particularly for a highly structured four-year apprenticeship. If you go through that whole process with Australian Apprenticeship Centres and all of the support that's provided and the whole matching process and the contract of training and uh, training agreements and all the stuff we've erected, um, you should actually expect completion rates to be pretty high. Now, clearly, people being young, they're always going to do odd and strange things and drop out and they might be the right employer. So the reasons that we explore in the report will always lead to a degree of non-completion. But um, we put quite a lot of thought into the strategies at the back of the paper, and I'll come back to those, to talk about um, some strategies that might be further considered and possibly considered by the board and advising government about things that could be um, done to, uh, uh, to further boost completion rates. Uh, Andrew will take us through the um, analysis and the findings. I just want to recognise um, the really terrific contribution of NCVR to the project in terms of the quality of the data analysis, reflecting on Jennifer's legacy, I don't know. <laughs> it's a long <laughs> yeah, um, They're a very good, um, uh, very good organisation to, uh, to partner with. Um, and I think the way that the NCVR now have really focused in on the 
on how you measure completions and the different ways in which completions are measured has actually finally brought a much better evidence base to the issue than has been there in the past. So I should recognise um, NCVR, they're not here today, but um, recognise their contribution in the project. And as I say, I'll hand over to Andrew now to take us through the analysis and findings and I'll come back to conclude by talking about some of the possible strategies and why we think they're important. Thanks, Peter. So the, um, the project we were, the brief we were given by the by ORPA um, was pretty wide ranging. I guess the first question was looking at um, what are current patterns in both commencements and completions of engineering trades, um, but also comparing them to all trades as well. And in the report, um, there's a lot more detail, obviously, in terms of what, in what we're presenting today. So if you are keen to sort of understand the detail, I'm sure Marilyn will. It may have already circulated to people the, the full report, so feel free to um, peruse that. I think it's about 150 pages in total. So hopefully, if you have any questions which we can't answer today, hopefully you'll be able to find the answer in the full report. So looking at what are the actual com commencements and completion rates, how do they vary by types of students, whether it be by state, age group, previous qualification levels, so school achievement and so forth, by a whole range of different um, parameters. And also what are the factors at least we can identify from existing research in our consultations, influencing both completion and also non-completion. It's absolutely like the first major part. And the second part is, well, given the findings of what completion rates are, what can be done to improve them? So looking at both in terms of what's happening now in RTOs and employers and governments in terms of steps taken to try and improve completions. Some of them are sort of quite um, sort of explicitly sort of focused on that sort of activity and others are sort of more just the way they do business and so that's the result of how they operate is they get good completions. So there's a bit of a mix of that. Trying then evaluating how effective different strategies can be, stakeholder views on them. And finally it's a broad indication about of the strategies we think are worth pursuing further, which sort of agencies or entities are, will be responsible for doing those but also what sort of implications could they be in terms of resource implications, so costs of time and money. So there are three main phases to the project. Um, phase one, which was very much under the um, ownership of the NCVR, was analysing um, the various national data collections, looking at commencements and completions. The second part was a detailed literature review that we did, and some assistance from the NCVR looking at what literature said about um, why apprentices do not complete and also what strategies can be done to try and improve completion. On that I should note that there wasn't anything particularly on engineering apprentices in the literature, so we had a broader, broader net in terms of looking at apprenticeships more generally in the literature. Um, and also finally we did a, a wide range of consultations across um, I think three states. Um, between September and November of last year. So we went to Townsville. We chose Townsville, this, we wanted a regional centre. We felt that they had a, quite a significant industrial presence. Um, and we sort of validated that by looking at ABS data as well. So Townsville, Perth, in terms of a, a, a city which has been very much influenced by the resources issues in terms of servicing that, that sort of industry. And finally, Melbourne. Um, well, Melbourne was chosen more for geographic reasons since the whole team is based in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a bit of quite diverse, divide, diverse location. So and we got quite good insights from a whole range of different perspectives in the course of the consultations. So starting with the, um, just giving a snapshot, so a couple of slides here about what are the completion rates, what's this commencement rather, commencement's like in terms of um, um, engineering trades. I just sort of say as preface this, there was a fair bit of debate about what is an engineering trade. We started going down a track, we thought, yeah, it looks fine. And we realised, oh, certain trades were missing. So we sort of stopped, did a stock take and so went back to first principles to identify what's an engineering trade, even looking up definitions of engineering, definitions of trades, and so sort of looking at the whole list of relevant ANSCO codes at the six digit level and going through them one by one. Yes, no, yes, no, and the author 
we had a fair bit of to and fro with Orca on that. So in the NCVR, so we had a fair bit of discussion about what, what was an engineering trade. But in terms of the scope of analysis that we chose, this gives a broad idea here in terms of um, three digit bands. So I should have had the names of them there, unless uh, with Orca you should probably know what they are. <laughs> but um, like 323 is, I'll give you a test afterwards. <laughs> Um, 323 is um, mechanical engineering trades workers. So we've had a great, there's a grand total of about um, there were 18 and a half thousand engineering trade um, commencements in 2005, and that by 2012 we got up to about 23,000. But you can see there's a gradual growth every year, but there's a big dip in 2009 due to the GFC. So we'll see later that actually engineering trades commencements got hit a lot harder than other trades. And that, that came through in our discussions as well. A lot of employers were, and some sort of regretted it in hindsight, were quick to um, either let current apprentices go or also put off bringing on new apprentices as well. So there's a big, big hit in, in the engineering trades. Um, but then ANSCO 323, that's um, mechanical engineering trades workers. 322 is fabrication engineering trades workers. The big one, um, and this is, is um, the automotive electricians and mechanics. And within that mechanic, auto, auto mechanics are the biggest single group of engineering trades workers. There was a fair bit of debate whether or not that should be in, but we decided to include that. And finally, the little one down the bottom, in, um, let's see, the gold is um, uh, building and engineering technicians. And that's sort of picked up a lot in the later years. Um, just to compare, so the, this is just engineering trades, but in terms of the um, commencements. It's just sort of looking at comparing to 2005 using an index, how did the engineering trades commencements compare to other all, all the trades? So, as I said before, there was a much bigger dip in um, engineering trades. So, um, compared to 2005, the commencements in 2009 were about 16% lower than um, 2005, and the, and the drop was much greater. The engineering trades compared to all, all the trades, all apprentice trades. Um, in terms of looking at the actual, and this is the main focus now, is the actual completion rates. So across all trades, using in the analysis done by the NCVR, there's a 56% completion rate. Within engineering trades, so all of the, the scope that we agreed on with the NCV, um, with Orpa, um, about 62%, but then it varies a lot on the basis of what is the specific trade, state and territory, the call level of the um, apprenticeship, um, and a whole range of other parameters which are, you'll see in the, in the report as well. So for example, the highest completion rates are in the mechanical engineering trades, and the lowest are in the building and engineering technicians trades. Whereas if you were comparing states and territories, um, Tasmania has the highest completion rate of it, at just at two thirds. Whereas um, the jurisdiction we're in right now, the ACT, had the lowest at 53.4. So there's a whole range of factors that could influence um, completion rates in terms of the characteristics of um, apprentices and the local economy. It's probably a huge factor. Um, we said there are some areas for further sort of more um, statistical research that we suggested in the report it could be used as a dig into that and sort of trying to unpack what are the more significant drivers of an, of an individual apprentice's completion rate. Just to note that, um, that the analysis here and the focus of the analysis was on what we call individual completion rates. So in terms of the completion rate, there's sort of two steps in how that's calculated. The first step is what they call the contract completion. So when an apprentice starts with an, with an employer, there's a contract between the apprentice and the um, employer for that apprenticeship. Um, but it's not uncommon for an apprentice to move from one employer to another, so that's a, there's a chat break in the contract. So that's the contract completion um, rate. But then the NCVR looks at com contract completion rates and then looks at what's the recommencement rate of apprentices. So that they know from the data they get if an, if an apprentice starts a new apprenticeship, so that's a recommencement, so from that analysis data, let's say, so start with a contract completion, add a recommencement rate to get what they call the individual completion rate, which is trying to focus on what's the 
overall completion rate of an apprentice who finishes their apprenticeship full stop as opposed to um, looking purely at contract completions. If you're looking at contract completions, that you get a lower, a lower estimate um, compared to the individual completions. Um, if you have questions about that, it's a bit technical to ask at the end, but in the, in the report we try quite hard to give a uh, good explanation about that. In terms of reasons for non-completion, um, we are able to draw, well, the NCVR model points out to draw from their apprentice and training destination survey to look at this question, the 2010 um, data set. They tried, literally started looking as well at the 2008 survey, but the number of engineering traits were quite small in that. So there's a whole range of questions which the survey asks about um, why former apprentices did not complete their um, apprenticeship. The most significant one for the engineering trades, and similarly for ore trades as well, was um, being, having lost their job or being made redundant by by the employer, so it wasn't uh, through their own choice, it was more imposed upon them by an employer. Doing something different or better is, is significant, um, personal reasons. So there's a whole range of factors. Um, one area that's sort of got a bit of debate right near the end of our finalising report was about the role of wages in the apprentice non-completion. That's only one of several factors we're examined under the doing something better different category. So as you can see here, it's half the reason compared to having lost a job. So sorry, sorry, can I just interrupt? Do wages, does the wages question come up with the second one, but doing something better? In terms of getting better, get, uh, moving to a different job for, for more money. Um, so that, that, you never think from memory there are three specific sub-questions within that category that they analysed. Um, as we say in the report, and we sort of, it's sort of difficult to sort of draw firm conclusions in terms of the role of the wages per se, but we think, generally speaking, it's more a factor influencing commencements in the first place. So if someone's going to be turned off by an apprenticeship wage, they might not commence in the first place, as, as opposed to falling out halfway through because it's pretty, it's pretty clearly publicised what the wages are and so forth. So that's an area that there is, there is a bit of debate about that issue. Um, yeah, that probably, um, and that was a little thought to leave out, to make one point, which is that probably it's apprentices with older apprentices who are a work of life with their income, that's not paying with the family commitment that they're passing on, like they're like 20. Probably going to be more of an impact because they might be aware, they might have been aware of what their personal circumstances are going to be compared to say to a young person. Um, so we just take that with a grain of salt. It is probably relevant to the age of this and the and the family and personal circumstances. Okay. The one area where um, the engineering trades reasons were significantly different to all trades was the very top one, the lost job of being made redundant. So all the other ones, they're not statistically significantly different to the raw trades estimate. Um, and the lost job of made redundant, I guess that um, sound, I guess that, that result, I just didn't realise this then actually, could have been influenced heavily by the that big dip in the 2009 commencements, for example, for apprentices who were um, that go, for example, that that would that could be a major factor then. So I suspect a more recent version of the survey not hasn't taken place yet. Could have a different different number again. Just in terms of the time it takes for um, apprentices to to those that don't complete, how how long, how long does that take? So this is using the contract data, so the contracts between employers and apprentices, um, looking at the contract attrition rate. So it's saying, and this is comparing engineering trades with the ore trades, and it's saying it's um, far more common, um, I guess the first thing is in the first two years, that's when the bulk of the non-completions occur. So for the engineering trades, in terms of the, the non-completion of contracts, looking at about 38% um, within two years and about 44% within two years for the ore trades. And after five years, it only raises up 
for, for engineering trades from the 38 up to about 45. So the vast majority of the non-completions of this of the contracts are in the first two years. And that sort of suggests that, yeah, that's when the focus of um, any intervention and so forth would need to be. And that's, that brings to also what is currently happening in this space. So there are certain jurisdictions have programs and so forth, which are focused more at the first six months, first one year period in terms of trying to um, improve completion rates. So in terms of just bringing together, I guess, what we found from the, 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 the data analysis, in terms of the survey analysis, the um, literature review, but also the consultations, because we spoke with a wide range of employers, um, RTOs, GTOs, um, state government departments, but also we spoke to a wide range of um, apprentices, non um, con apprentice non-completers as well, so to sort of get their perspective on the issue, but also some completers as well, so still sort of getting a wide range of views about factors influencing completion and non-completion. So we spoke to a wide range of people. I should say that it was a bit difficult to get hold of the non-completers, but um, with some help from some of the state training authorities out to get to speak to some of them. So in terms of just bringing together what sort of the overarching factors that we feel sort of identified as being major factors. And so we've grouped these into sort of a chronological approach starting from people before and during the apprenticeship. So the before factors we think are pretty important um, in terms of the apprentice characteristics. So looking at the degree of aptitude that the apprentice has for the engineering trade. So this question mark about trying to improve knowledge and aptitude for engineering trades. Educational attainment is a significant factor, so whilst it's not like high-end maths, for example, in terms of the engineering trades, and it is a requirement for this recent degree of mathematical skill in running these big lathes and so forth and programming them, so they're reasonably complicated. Um, another important factor is the recruitment processes undertaken by employers to obtain apprentices and particularly what sort of um, what the what how do they filter and assess potential apprentices as well so they're the before apprenticeship um, factors and during apprenticeship there's a whole range of factors that cut across um, the, the three or four years but more focused we think in the first couple of years so there are the workplace characteristics and support factors, the degree of formal support provided by employers to apprentices, but not just employers, but GTOs or RTOs as well. So there's a range of entities involved in providing support to, to the apprentices. How the employer approaches apprentice training in terms of um, providing the ongoing mentoring and training role within the workplace. And also just the support mechanisms available to employers in terms of their supporting them undertaking their role as a mentor and a trainer of apprentices. In terms of formal training, so that's un as undertaken by um, particularly the RTOs, um, it's the off-the-job the off training requirement and making sure that it aligns with both the employer and the um, apprentice needs. And, and so there's been a, there's a fair bit of discussion about how well does that off-the-job training f um, align with support with what's happening on the job as well. So there's an issue about how well they're aligned and working together. And finally, the issue about the apprentice remuneration. Um, wage progression over the course of the apprenticeship is seen as being reasonably important in terms of um, there being a recognition as apprentices move on about their skills developing and their productivity improving and how that flows through to their, their wages. But also, we think there's also a fact about just improving awareness about what are the wage prospects following the apprenticeship. So it does seem that for at least some of the non-completers there's a lack of awareness or realisation about what is the expectation of wage growth and so forth once they do finish their apprenticeship. So there are quite good prospects once they finish but it's a matter of finishing before they can get those awards. So the short term pain versus the long term gain is sort of, the, sort of a debate issue. So the next couple of slides I'm going to talk about in terms of the strategies. Um, as um, 
I said when we started, we did we did give quite a lot of thought to what kind of strategies we might be able to present so that the board itself could um, take um, not just the analysis but actually take something forward uh, usefully the government. I, I just want to make one comment about the data we've seen. I suppose my concern is um, I think we, we've done this study post-GFC and with the data that's come through with the uptake my feeling is that, and certainly from the consultations we've done for this project, but also for the Building Australia's Future Workforce evaluation uh, that ASL Allen's been doing over two years for the department, um, there's no doubt in my mind that the engineering firms we spoke to for that study in this, the second year, the, the impact of the Australian dollar, the structural factors in the economy, the slowdown in mining, uh, I think will probably have another impact on the on those um, commencement numbers and possibly on, uh, for some employers, their long-term commitment to being able to sustain the apprenticeship. Um, I mean, we'll see, but I just have a feeling that that's all going to be part of the shake-up around the manufacturing industry and, and also the slowdown in mining. What we tried to do in looking at the strategies was to really focus on um, uh, this framework, I suppose, which is to look at the important points of intervention across the years and the lifespan of the apprenticeship. And the first one is um, directed, there are a series of strategies which are essentially about the, what you might call the apprentice characteristics. Now, what's not so strongly in the report but came through pretty strongly in the consultations is also the question of literacy, numeracy, aptitude and the general preparation of apprentices for um, entry to these skilled trades. Um, and it's it's a matter of conjecture whether, uh, and we canvass it in the report, whether you know standards are falling or whether brighter kids who might have gone into an apprenticeship in previous decades are possibly going to university and therefore employers aren't recruiting from the cream um, as I might. That's an area I think it would be worth, worth studying. Um, but what's unique about the engineering trades is that um, there's a bit of a coming together of um, a lack of preparation, both in terms of literacy and numeracy, uh, but also uh, skills and aptitudes and understanding of what these careers are. So if you look at other trades, if somebody says carpenter, bricklayer, auto mechanic, they've got a pretty clear idea what the occupation is. Engineering can, of course, mean, I mean, universities teach engineering, or we're still talking about boilermakers and fitters and machinists and all those things. Um, and of course there's a lot of industrial resistance to changing these terms and changing these classifications but almost unanimously people were saying these terms are either not understood or can convey completely the wrong meaning. So if you say to a young person, you know, do you want to become a boilermaker? Well, no, who would want to be a boilermaker today? But in fact if you look at the range of skills that are involved in the traditional trade of boilermaking, there's a whole lot of really interesting skill and quite high paying jobs. Um, that fall under that. So for engineering, and this, this finding is very specific to engineering, there certainly needs to be an improved understanding of the range of jobs and skills and occupational outcomes. So I think for the Skills Council, for the department, for ORPA and so on, there is something about engineering that needs to be, uh, needs to be um, pursued. Uh, and it's, so it's distribution of high quality materials and so on, but if, also if you look at the betting schools numbers for these um, courses, they're pretty low and uh, a lot of kids doing better in schools courses aren't getting proper exposure to um, particularly the better workplaces that might make them interested in their career. So a lot of apprentices seem to kind of fall de facto into these jobs in an incidental way rather than a planned and structured way. Um, similarly, in terms of support, um, what uh, we found was that there's a there's a very big difference between the employers who are uh, bigger and larger, have good HR departments and have a long-standing and high-quality engagement with the apprenticeship system, with state training authorities, with the Australian Apprenticeship Centres and so on. In other words, they really know the system, know how to work it, know how to present and package material. Um, we spoke to one terrific firm out in uh, Melbourne where the, the retired founder of the firm still comes to the apprentice 
intake barbecue on a Sunday with all the families and still gives a speech of welcome and meets all the mums and dads. And so the whole thing is a real commitment from the company to say you are the new recruits, you are the future of the company and so on. Compare that to other um, examples where maybe in a small company the apprentice kind of stumbles in by accident and um, the, the, the employer's not really clear what's involved, etc., etc. So the whole thing kind of diverges at that point. Um, so um, the support for, for and guidance for employers around HR practices and Australian Industry Group is doing this as, as is the um, Victorian Chamber of um, Automotive whatever they are, the automotive chamber anyway in Victoria, uh, in Victoria, are also trying to provide a lot more structured in support for the employer members. But both employer organisations will concede the problem is that people who tend to come to those workshops and participate are the, are the better employers anyway, so they're, they're still not getting to the employers who probably need the most support. Um, still also a lot of complaints from employers about complexity, paperwork, confusion and um, so on. Um, Probably the main thing we would really emphasise, though, is is this question of uh, matching employees and apprentices. So that um, you know, I'll, I'll be frank here. Um, at the moment, um, I think our judgment would be that neither the Australian Apprenticeship Centres nor the state apprenticeship bodies uh, are providing the kind of role that we probably had in mind when the system was first designed, where with the signing of the training agreement and that whole process that's meant to go on to um, match employers and apprentices and get a training agreement and make sure that they're um, choosing wisely and people know what they're getting into. Um, the impression is that the Australian Apprenticeship Centres are, are largely transactional in nature, they're dealing mainly with administrative side of things and pushing people through. And the state training authorities these days have become the, the, the role in this area is largely, largely residual, so they're receiving and processing training agreements. But um, there's not the same uh, support and advice and assistance to make sure that the matching process is really working for employers and apprentices who need it. And when you think about it, given there are other findings around the importance of the workplace experience um, and the fact that that seems to contribute most to low completions or to people falling out, um, we would really emphasise the importance of better matching. Um, and that includes support and guidance for employers uh, in recruitment and, uh, and selection strategies. Um, as I said, better information about the engineering trades to increase the pool of quality applicants. Um, and that basically means updated information on job roles and the range of work and engagement with students, parents, career advisors, etc. etc. Uh, to try and get a better pool of well informed apprentices with strong vocational interests who are most likely to complete. Uh, what we found in talking to the apprentices was that the ones who knew exactly what they were coming into had a real interest in the trade, possibly because their father or a, an uncle or a family friend was in the trade and they knew exactly what the trade was about. Um, were and were therefore motivated, were most likely to compete. Um, so what, what we're talking about doing here is actually trying to, if you like, build up a bigger pool of potential applicants from whom employers could choose because, again, the good employers we chose from, the place I mentioned out in Melbourne, W.D. Adams, um, they get, I think, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something like 15 apprentices and they get, they're choosing from over 100 um, so they're actually able to draw from a very wide range of pools compared to other employers we spoke to who are basically saying, well, we kind of take what we can get. So the, the variation between, a, between that organisation and others was significant. And we do see an important role to rethink the role of the Australian Apprenticeship Centres to have a more active role in assisting employers rather than just being transactional. Um, I've spoken about the advisory services. What we also found was that the uh, mentoring, the Australian Apprenticeship Mentoring Program that was established, I think, two or three years ago, um, of all of the programs that um, uh, were mentioned, and we found the same thing, by the way, in the Building Australia's Future Workforce Study, um, the mentoring one gets a really big tick. 
Um, and uh, that's both from the point of view of the organisations who are running it, from RTOs and group schemes, but also from the, uh, from the, from the individual employers. What it means is, is that with the, the way the mentors work, basically means that a lot of the um, sharp edges that can occur in when the relationship between an apprentice and an employer starts to deteriorate, a lot of the mentors are older, they're experienced, they've been through it, and they can come in and be a bit of a neutral party um, to help resolve some of those issues. And it seems to be particularly important for, for young apprentices who don't really have anywhere else to go. You know, their families might know, can't give the advice. The RTOs aren't that highly engaged in what's happening in the workplace. Uh, and of course, they're a bit scared to talk to the boss. So um, the mentoring program has got a, got a big tick. What we uh, found was that training quality wasn't identified as a significant factor in apprenticeship non-completions. That's not to say that training quality was uniformly brilliant, but it's just that it wasn't... Because, you, because your TAFE or your private RTO isn't providing quite the quality of training that you might have expected, it's not actually forcing people to drop out. What it may mean is that they, they would switch RTO to go somewhere else. It's not ideal, but it doesn't seem to be a major factor in uh, non-completions. But um, in terms of learner support, to, um, disability, low levels of language, literacy and numeracy, um, and um, that if you're going to target anything in terms of the activities of RTOs, it would be in that area. Because what it means is that um, people, apprentices who aren't aware of the complexity of what they're getting into, who don't have good literacy skills, who start with the employer and then they hit TAFE or hit the RTO, then find over time that their literacy skills aren't adequate to make it through. Um, and certainly anecdotally, and certainly you know, if you look at APLAN and other things, there is certainly evidence about declining literacy in the pool of apprentices coming through. So um, the need for a continuing focus on literacy within the formal program, training program structure was also uh, important. Um, we'll wait and see what happens with the Fair Work Australia wage decision. Um, we sort of asked and we got very different views, even from employers. Some employers were saying wage is too low, we're happy to pay the extra, we'll get better kids and we're just going to swallow it and get on with it. Others, group training organisations were really worried in terms of the impact on their charge out rates. Um, it may um, play a role in attracting higher quality candidates and therefore getting better candidates, meaning that retention rate, rates go up. Uh, but it could also lead to some employers, particularly ones who are uh, facing a lot of cost and competitive pressures, cancelling contracts or opting not to take um, new apprentices on. Um, uh, as the point says, the consultations indicated wage levels are not a significant factor in non-completions, and that's because apprentices are reasonably aware of what they're going to get into. But again, I'll just add my comment there about the age factor. So I think that's basically a bit of a, a wait and see one to see what happens. Um, although it might be hard to disentangle the impact of the wage decision from the general economic conditions. Um, and then, I won't go through all of this in detail, but basically we've looked at um, the bodies that would be responsible for um, implementing the range of strategies that we've uh, put in the paper and the resource implications. Um, I think our general view is that a lot of this doesn't require a massive injection of resources, it just requires a refocusing of roles, a stronger emphasis of roles in some areas, a continuation of some programs or a possible expansion of them, um, but particularly better coordination between the Australian Apprenticeship Centres and the State Training Authorities um, at, at the front end and then, uh, and then during the process. Um, and that's just the appendix with all the, all the definitions. So I think we'll leave it there and then take questions and discussion.